on the 20th of February in 2022, I was in Kiev and we were holding a national day of prayer, praying particularly against the threat of an invasion from the Russians. But so many did not believe that it would happen. On the 24th of February, 2022, within minutes of Putin's short televised address, in which he announced a special military operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, the country was under attack from crews and ballistic missiles. Explosions were heard in and around major Ukrainian cities, including the capital, Kiev. Low-flying attack helicopters suddenly appeared over Kostomel Military Airport, which is just outside Kiev. And by 10 o'clock that first morning, the airport had been seized and the surrounding civilian apartment blocks and infrastructure blasted to destruction. I have been back to Kostomel Airport and in those weeks and months after the war started, I have seen what happened and met the commander of the military defending the airport uh, on that day when it first happened and he spoke with me and explained in his own words what had happened. That morning, all Ukraine woke to realize that the most brutal, barbaric attempt to obliterate our nation from the face of the earth had begun. On the 24th of February, 2022, when the Russians invaded Kiev, and this, by the way, is Maidan in the center of Kiev, they expected to be able to take this city, Kiev, within three days, or certainly a maximum of two weeks. And they thought that they would be greeted with flowers and people waiting to welcome them. And instead, they were met by a determination of the people to defend their country and a determination to fight for their freedom. By the 20th of March, less than one month after the Russian invasion began, approximately one quarter of the country's total population, women and children, had fled their homes in Ukraine. By the late May 2022, nearly 8 million had fled Ukraine and were dispersed all over Europe and elsewhere, while an estimated 8 million had been internally displaced. And of course, that doesn't include those who died, those who were wounded, not just the military, but also civilians, as well as those, of course, who were defending the nation. Many were abducted and some were taken to Russia against their will. Unfortunately, the names of those abducted mostly not officially recorded or reported to the Ukraine, simply they were classed as disappeared, their destiny unknown. This is an internationally recognized crime against humanity. In the first 10 months of the war, the world saw Putin's Russia commit every kind of war crime in the book. The very same indiscriminate war crimes that they had already committed earlier in the two Chechen wars and in Georgia, both like Ukraine dependent, now independent, former Soviet 
republics. Also, what was happening in Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, and Nauta in Syria, where aerial bombardments that flattened major cities and towns and small settlements, which meant destroying homes, apartment blocks, and smaller dwellings, that smashed the civilian infrastructure with its power stations, hospitals, schools, markets, and of course food stores, wiping out the people waiting patiently, even those sheltering in underground spaces or trying to flee along escape routes. All of this in violation of international law using this is the fact that the Soviets, the Russians, were using fire bombs, cluster bombs, even phosphorus bombs. And later to come, they were using vacuum missiles. They were also torturing, murdering, raping and abducting and even resettling children in unknown destinations. In the interior of Russia. They were pillaging, looting. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands of civilians, adults and children were killed, injured, crippled or kidnapped in only the first 10 months of this Russian invasion. Why? to denazify Ukraine, a, a nation with a Jewish president, to stop NATO encroaching on uh, Russian uh, borders uh, via Ukraine. But NATO had already ruled out Ukrainian accession long before the war. Or, as the Russians also said, Ukraine isn't a nation at all, but a part of Russia, and as such, needs to be restored. Or, as they said, Ukraine is simply terrorists and must be stopped. Oh. Or, additionally, Ukrainians are Satanists and out to destroy Christianity. The Assistant Secretary of the Russian Security Council, Alexei Pavlov, publicly announced that the next stage of this so-called special operation should be the de-Satanization of Ukraine. This became a popular cry on social media, meaning in part that the explosion of new churches that had followed the wave of revival evangelism following the collapse of communism, the Russians, by the way, call these new churches just simply sects, which they have united, yes, in prayer. And that was one of the big things under my leadership as the direct result of this military operation which had started in 2014, it meant that I was able to unite all the Christians. And it's the only nation in the world where we were able to unite every single Christian denomination in prayer because of the threat of what was happening. Of course, earlier in that first invasion in 2014, uh, Crimea had been taken, the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. But amazingly, in Russia, Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church calls the Russian invasion of 2022, a holy war. And Putin, 
a fighter against Antichrist. And so he, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, gave his blessing to the murderous war of terror being waged on Ukrainian soil. On the 1st of December 2022, President Zelensky said, our desire to live freely and as an independent sovereign nation as expressed um, in the agreement on the 24th of August and confirmed on December the 1st, 1991, will not be broken. Ukrainians will never again be small cogs in some greater empire. We've already gained and will ensure the full independence of our sovereign state. In particular, we will protect our spiritual independence. We will never allow anyone to build their empire inside Ukrainian soil. The older generation remembers the bipolar east-west world of the 20th century, where since the end of World War II and until this present day, two superpowers have struggled for world supremacy. The former communist Soviet bloc, now the Russian Federation, against the United States of America supported with Western allies, which includes, of course, Europe and specifically Britain. But on the 24th of February 2022, the eyes of the whole world turned towards Ukraine. So few in this present generation know much about this relatively small country. Small, at least in comparison with Russia, a nation which has the largest landmass in the world. But in fact, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe and the 44th largest country in the world for centuries. Ukraine, because of its rich mineral black soil and the hardworking people, cultivators, who toil in the fields day and night were known as the breadbasket of the world and, of course, the Soviet Union itself. This is why Russia's blockade of the export of Ukrainian grain in the spring and summer of 2022 risked worldwide famine. Less well known about the Ukraine are the valuable deposits of rare earth minerals in Donbass, vital for the functioning of all advanced modern technologies, and possession of which would make Russia, the Russian oligarchs, or the Wagner group of mercenaries rich. Makes you wonder why the Wagner military was so interested in being involved. I'm sure they saw this possibility or these precious valuable deposits which would make the Ukraine herself rich. And not only rich, but one of the most desirable countries in the world in order to trade with not forgetting the oil and gas fields in the Black Sea near Odessa. One wonders why uh, when the Russians seized that tiny little snake island in the start of 2022, it was because it's part of the key to the exploitation of the wealth beneath the Black Sea. Fortunately, it was eventually liberated 
and the Russians have not been able to take it back. And of course, the Black Sea is a major issue because it's the base of part of the Russian fleet. Now, whether you are Russian, inhabiting the propaganda universe created by Putin's evil regime, or you're a stranger to these things and live in a more normal world, it's hard to keep up with and to comprehend the changing reasons why Russia found it imperative to ruthlessly attack, brutalize and butcher Ukraine and its civilian population. Though Putin at first said Russia didn't intend to occupy Ukraine, he added a chilling warning to other nations in his address on the 24th of February. In these words, he said, to anyone who would consider interfering from the outside, if you do, you will face consequences greater than any you have faced in previous history. All relevant decisions have been taken. I hope you hear me, he said. And in a terrible warning, he said, we will keep the nuclear option open. From the point of view of history, uh, literally from all of modern history, since the time of Christ, the continent of Europe, from Spain, Portugal on the Atlantic side to Western Russia, as far as the Eurasian continental divide in the Ural Mountains, this area has been a seething cauldron of competing expansionist people, groups and nations, overspilling, never actually necessarily changing national boundaries, but forming and dissolving internal European and external world empires. In particular, much fought over territories from the Baltics to the Black Sea, including Ukraine, became known as the bloodlands of Europe. Two days before his invasion of the Ukraine, Putin made a speech in which he claimed Ukraine has no history as a nation in its own right, but is a modern creation of Vladimir Lenin, who carved it as an independent Soviet Republic out of Russian land. So according to Putin's version of history, Ukraine did not appear on the world map until the Tsarist Russian Empire was overthrown by the Communist Revolution of 1917. This is not correct. Kiev was founded in 482. It's one of the oldest cities in Europe and was the capital of what was known as Kievian Rus, which was to become known as Ukraine, had no connection with Russia, which did not even then exist. Moscow was not founded until 1147, 665 years later, and was settled on the outer fringe of Kievian Rus by a different people group. Moscow has never been at any time in history the capital of the Ukraine. Kiev is. The Christianization of Ukraine began with Vladimir the Great, also known as Vladimir the Baptizer. He was the Grand Prince of Kievian Rus, 
from 980 to 1015 and ruled over extensive territories from Novgorod to Poland. He converted to Christianity in 988 AD, bringing the whole nation with him. Fundamentally, this altered the historical trajectory of Kievan Rus. Vladimir the Baptizer, as he was generally known, became revered as a saint in both Western Christianity and in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Being known as Saint Vladimir or Saint Vladimir, the Kiev metropoly, subordinate to Constantinople, was founded in Ukraine in 988, the year of Vladimir's conversion. 460 years before the creation of the very different Moscow Patriarch in 1448. Subject to no one, the Moscow Patriarch was a political creation of the 15th century of the Christian era. In effect, a third Rome vying for world authority with Rome and the Roman Catholic Church and Constantinople with the Orthodox Church. Kievan Rus first identified as Ukraine in historical chronicles dated 1187. Russia did not yet exist as a nation at that time. Russia is first mentioned in historical chronicles only in the reign of Ivan the Terrible, 400 years later, being first Grand Prince of Moscow from 1553 to 1547. From 1547 to 1584, he ruled by terror as the first Tsar of all Russia. Stalin, the most terrible of the leaders of communist Russia, modeled himself on Ivan the Terrible. You ask who are Putin's heroes? Yes, Stalin and Ivan the Terrible, and he tries to add in Peter the Great. What can be known from historical records is that Ukrainian lands have had ties to Western Europe and Western European ruling families from the earliest of times. And at critical moments in the formation of Ukrainian identity, making it linguistically and culturally distinct from the Russia we know. But for over a hundred years since the 1917 Communist Revolution, the world has known Ukraine only as an intrinsic part of Russia. The West, I'm sorry to say, has been sold a lie. History proves different. Moscow or Moscovy was Asian. It wasn't even European. Despite being on the eastern extremity of the European continental shelf, the Mongol invasions and consequent heavy Tatar yoke tore Russia from the West, isolating it from Europe, stamping its unbending strength on an iron autocracy, political and religious, that brutalized the serfdom it controlled. Seeing the greater prosperity of the West, Russia only began a search for closer ties with Europe under Peter the Great, then Catherine the Great in the 18th century. Meanwhile, Ukraine was frequently crushed between the millstones of the Russian Empire on one side and the Nordic 
Germanic empires and principalities on the other side. Despite all this, it is Ukraine which had one of the first written constitutions in the world, dated the 5th of April, 1710. The United States of America followed suit 77 years later, in 1787. France and Poland in 1791. Russia, on the other hand, first drafted something of a constitution only in 1832, revising it again in 1906, just 11 years before the Russian Revolution brought in communism as the new rule of law, or should we rather say as a new reel of terror modeled on Ivan the Terrible. From the middle to the end of the late 19th century, Poles and Ukrainians were conquered nations, but living with autonomy under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Still, the never-ending European bloodletting continued. Boundaries of empires and nations were again forcibly moved. And by the 1870s, Ukrainians and Poles were both under the ruthless control of the Russian Empire, radically suppressing Ukrainian national identity. All journalistic, scientific and cultural activities in the Ukrainian language were banned. Local Ukrainian teachers were sent into exile deep within the vast Russian expanses, very often Siberia, and were replaced with Russian educators. The turn of the 20th century found the Ukrainians and the Poles in a state of complete captivity. And the 20th century was to prove to be the most violent century yet in human history. The First World War erupted in the heart of Europe in 1914. It was the first of the deadliest global conflicts ever seen in history. The main belligerent included much of Europe and their colonial empires supported, including Britain and the British Empire and the United States, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and even, surprisingly, the Japanese Empire with fighting in the Middle East, Africa, the Pacific, and parts of Asia. This is incredible. An estimated nine million soldiers were killed in combat worldwide, and another 23 million wounded, while five million civilians died as a result of this military action, hunger, and disease which followed. Millions more died in the Armenian genocide within the Ottoman Empire, and millions died in the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was accelerated and really came following the movement of combatants and the appalling living conditions during that First World War. The war on the continent of Europe itself was a war of what one called seismic upheavals of crashing tectonic plates with Germany and her allies, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, 
Bulgaria and Italy at the epicenter, pitted against Britain and France on the Western Front and against Russia on the Eastern Front. Finally, seeing a failing Tsarist regime on the Eastern Front, Germany, in a desperate bid to destroy at least one mortal enemy, in 1917 sent a certain Vladimir Lenin in a, a sealed and armoured train across war-torn Europe into Russia to topple the Russian Empire and with German and American finances, yes, I hope you understand what we're saying, that the communist revolution was supported by German and American finance to bring about the success of the 1917 communist revolution. However, Poles and Ukrainians who had been, since the 1870s, subjugated under a cruel Tsarist yoke, were now ready to rebel and fight Lenin's new Red Army. On the 22nd of January 1918, Ukraine declared an independent Ukrainian People's Republic. But, by the 8th of February, Soviet troops had entered and taken Kiev. Lenin created a Soviet Republic out of Ukraine and by deporting whole people groups, Ukraine was Russified over the following decades. Ukraine remained under the control of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, until 1991, when the USSR, the Soviet Union, was dissolved into its component parts. All 15 Soviet republics that made up the greater Russian Empire, the USSR, of which, of course, Russia itself was a major part, regained their individual national independence. It's simply not right, and it's impossible to understand why in our 21st century that Putin's Russia has twice attempted to take Kiev as Lenin's Russia did in 1918. But to take Kiev was Putin's plan in 2014 when Russian separatists and Russian troops entered Donbass in East Ukraine. I was in Slavyansk because the troops actually retreated by a miracle in the night. They went back 20 kilometers, leaving abandoned tanks and guns and even uneaten food and coffee. That is a, a miracle in itself. It's the prayers of the church because in actual fact, they had put their guns in the church in order that they could fire on the uh, Ukrainians in the hope that the Ukrainians returning the fire would destroy the church. But, by the grace of God, the Russian advance was stopped precisely there in Slovyansk. Again, on the 24th of February, 2022, Russia's plan was to use the Gostomel airport as a platform for the offensive to take Kiev as the capital and to depose the president, by then it was Zelensky, back in 2014, post-Soviet Ukraine was still a nation with some divided allegiance owing to the Russification of the country in the Soviet times. In the East, particularly 
two whole generations had grown up and been educated or <laughs> rather indoctrinated in Communist Party propaganda. They'd known little else. Following Putin's illegal annexation of the Crimea, and that is a story in itself, and occupation of the Donbass in the east, I saw an opportunity and called for seven national days of united prayer and persuaded the heads of every Christian denomination in Ukraine to join me in praying in unity. No other nation in the whole world has ever succeeded in this, in bringing together all Christian denominations as one before God in prayer. So, when Putin again invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February, four days after I'd held the last of those days of prayer, the whole world was astonished to see that even in the secular realm, Ukraine had become united as a nation spiritually, which made her better prepared to resist with a power both unexpected and previously unknown to defend itself against a greater enemy. But going back to 1918, to Western Europe fighting on the Western Front could no longer be sustained. On November the 11th, an armistice was signed between the Western Allies and an exhausted and sadly humiliated Germany was part of that agreement. Out of the four major land empires engaged in World War I, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire, only one of these four empires remained intact. Significantly, it was Russia. While for the Western Allies, hostilities with Germany came to an end in 1918, the Russians continued fighting on the Eastern Front, which now became the Western Front of the Russian Civil War, with the Red Army pushing on towards Central Europe. However, Lenin's advance was fiercely resisted by the Polish, Ukrainian, Lithuanian and Latvian wars of independence, all on territories formerly held and often fought over by the Austria-Hungarian and Russian empires, with Poland being the strongest element in the resistance the Polish-Soviet war began in late autumn 1918 and lasted until the 18th of March 1921. Poland was the bridge Lenin had to cross in order to join with the developing revolutionaries in Central Europe. The goal was to bring communist revolution throughout Europe. The fight put up by the Poles and Ukrainians from 1918 to 21 undoubtedly preserved Europe from the worst of the Red Army. Today, Ukraine is again protecting Europe, this time from Putin's dream to restore the Eastern Bloc of the Soviet Empire as he knew it in the period from 1945 to 1989. 
Poland and the Baltic states understand this. This is why they are so anxious to supply weapons to the Ukraine. Peace in Europe in the years to come depends on Ukraine's victory over Putin's imperialistic Russia today. No victory. No peace, yes. European and America are paying the price for peace in the Ukraine with their finances and resources and weapons. But remember that the Ukraine is paying the price for the peace of Europe with their own blood, with their own boys, their men, and even the civilians who are dying for the cause. In the same way, it was the Poles who successfully halted the Soviet army westward aggression in 1921. The peace treaty that ended the Polish-Soviet war granted Poland possession of West Ukraine and the city of Lviv, while Soviet forces took control of Kiev and all of East Ukraine. Ukrainian national identity was thus mercifully preserved in West Ukraine, but heavily suppressed by Russia in the East. Across the whole of Europe, the 1920s uh, remained a time of communist revolutionary upheaval. Now, this was a danger that Hitler and his brown shirts regularly and loudly confronted. Unfortunately, it's hard to actually see the real difference between the ways and the means employed by Hitler's brown shirts, his fascists on the one hand, and the Reds in communism on the other. Whereas in the 1920s, the East saw the suppression of national identity with Russification of all the lands that had been forcibly joined to the USSR. Lenin had died in 1924 and was succeeded by the even more reactionary Stalin. Stalin, whose idol was Ivan the Terrible, immediately initiated a mass ideological repression, which lasted until his death in 1953. Hundreds of thousands, millions of so-called enemies of the state were executed, and he oversaw ethnic cleansing, massive deportations of whole populations, and set in motion the artificial famines that starved millions of innocent Soviet citizens to death. But with total disregard for life, Stalin's inhuman policies forced, particularly in Russia and also in the Ukraine, as we'll see in a moment, his forced collectivization of the land, taking it away from the people, brought out an immediate and entirely artificial famine. Firstly in Kazakhstan, which led to the death of more than a quarter of the republic's population. This was in 1930. Using the perverse logic that Putin still uses today, Stalin declared it was the people of Kazakhstan who brought this on themselves. Having such success in Kazakhstan and to subdue the ancient and invincible Ukrainian national identity, Stalin implemented the same devastating policy on Ukrainian territory. 1931, 2 and 3 saw a genocide against the Ukrainian people, which became known as the Holodomor, in other words, death by hunger. Overnight, individual ownership of the old traditional ways of farming, the land was abolished, the grain harvest was compulsory exported to the West, 
to fund the industrialization of Soviet society, even the seed grain necessary for the next year's harvest was confiscated. Release of any information in the public domain was a crime. Any starving person from the countryside appearing in the cities of the Ukraine was punished as a criminal, a provocateur against the Soviet state. No records of this genocide were kept or allowed. However, estimates for the loss of life ranged from 3 million up to 10 and a half million, according to the latest research. It is claimed that more Ukrainians died by famine in the Ukraine in two years than Hitler's 6 million in the Holocaust. Tragically, Many Ukrainian Jews who survived the Holodomor later became victims of the Holocaust, both on Ukrainian territory and in Poland, victims both of the Soviet and the German anti-Semitic spirit. Many stories of the artificial famine that are known today are the testimony of those who first survived Stalin's Holodomor and then survived Hitler's Holocaust. A Welsh investigative journalist, Gareth Jones, at one time he was private secretary to the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, was the only foreign reporter who managed to penetrate the Soviet territories, where this systematic death by hunger was taking place. He made three visits between 1931 and 1933, first reporting anonymously in the Western press, but having published under his own name, he was banned from re-entering the Soviet Union. Sadly, in 1935, he was mysteriously kidnapped and murdered. The European Union officially recognized this death by hunger, this Holodomor, as a genocide only as recently as 2022. Significant that that was the year of the present attack. The only effective bastion of Ukrainian identity throughout history has been with the peasants in the countryside who passed on their unique identity through their language, through their folk traditions and culture, regardless of who ruled over them. Peasants were not necessarily poor, but industrious, prosperous workers, traders, farmers, artisans, artists, poets, historians, scientists, sustainers of stable communities. They were the bulwark of resistance to the imposed Soviet way of life with its remorseless, enforced collectivization of land and of industry. With the Ukrainian intelligentsia liquidated prior to and during the famine, the severity of the death by hunger saw to it that Ukrainian culture and the Soviet Union was virtually fully suppressed. Of course, Ukrainian nationalism stayed alive in the hearts and the memories of those Ukrainians who survived and of those who somehow managed to escape the Soviet Union, even though all external borders were closed to stop the flight out of hell. This near total suppression lasted until 
Khrushchev's thaw came in the 1950s to the mid-1960s. Ukrainian nationalist violin began to blossom under Gorbachev's policies of perestroika and glasnost in the mid-1980s to late 1980s. Worldwide, the 20th century is recognized as the bloodiest century in human history. For Putin, however, the greatest catastrophe of the century was not World War I or World War II, or even the Holodomor or the Holocaust, which are barely recognized or acknowledged in Russia. But to him, the greatest thing is the loss in 1989 through to 91 of the post-World War Soviet Empire, which had been ceded to Stalin by the Western Allies in the 1945 Yalta Conference. An empire that divided Europe by an iron curtain that stretched from the Baltics, including all of Eastern Europe and half of Germany. A goal Russia had failed to achieve even in the aftermath of World War I, when only the armed resistance of the Ukraine and Poland held her back, now has been given to her by a conference of Western leaders in Yalta who yielded these countries to the Soviet Empire and control under the Soviets. Who are Putin's heroes? Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great. His goals and methods are the same. The West is afraid of World War III, but in fact it's the Ukraine who is paying for the peace of Europe with their own blood, and only an independent, strong, and united Ukraine can protect the integrity of Europe from the advancing Russian aggression. And the fear is strongest in the hearts of those who lived so long under that oppression, and who now have freedom. Ukraine wants freedom and her own identity, realizing how long she has existed.